Hello. It is great to be back at Google. I met Larry Page and Sergey Brin in 1999. We were actually all part of a World Economic Forum group called the Global Leaders for Tomorrow. And there were about 50 of us a year from different industries and different countries. And most of us had actually been using Google Search before. So none of us were particularly surprised by the trajectory of, of Larry and Sergey. But I vividly remember early on the two of them sitting down with this very animated Chinese guy who had been this English teacher and had set up the yellow pages, the online yellow pages of China. And he had this idea for this big marketplace. It seemed quite improbable to most people. And in fact, he was known as Crazy Jack. And I'm sure many of you are guessing that this is Jack Ma, who just took Alibaba public. So yet another example of why crazy is a compliment. I want to step back and share a little bit about how I got here. So I grew up outside of Boston in a traditional family. My parents met as high school sweethearts in Rhode Island. My dad went on to be a lawyer. My mom stayed at home to raise three kids. And they are very loving, very focused on education, and inherently risk averse. So I, some of this rubbed off on me. I went to Harvard for college. I went to Yale for law school got to law school and figured I had no interest in practicing law. So I found out about this opportunity to go to Latin America after law school. My parents assumed it was you know, a one year kind of Peace Corps type thing. And I got to, I started in Chile and Uruguay, landed in Argentina and just fell in love with the culture, learned tango and rooted for local soccer teams. But something started happening, which is that now it was the mid-90s, and everyone at home was talking about Yahoo and Netscape and this entrepreneurial revolution that was going on. And in Latin America, all the young people I met were aspiring to government jobs, and this was very confusing to me. And my aha moment came when I was late for a meeting in Buenos Aires and got into a taxi and learned that my driver had an engineering degree so I asked what I thought was the logical question, which is, you know, excuse me, but what are you dr doing driving a cab? And he proceeded to say that the governments weren't hiring and all the old school companies didn't have any use for someone with his skills. And I tried to ask why it was that he wasn't starting a new company, becoming an entrepreneur, and I realized I didn't know the word in Spanish for entrepreneur. And though it's hard to believe today, 20 years ago, there was no word actively used in Spanish or Portuguese or Turkish or Arabic for entrepreneur. Uh, now, I, I say this and so that the blogosphere won't get mad at me and say, oh, you gringa, you don't know, emprendedor, emprendedorismo exists. In fact, I will, I will scroll and then go backwards, but five years into starting Endeavor, we got a call from the editor of the Portuguese Brazilian dictionary saying partly because of Endeavor's work, he was adding the term emprendedor and emprendedorismo into the lexicon. So there is a word today, but there really wasn't. And this was this moment for me when I said, wait a minute, why isn't there an organization to support these dreamers, these innovators in places that don't support risk taking. But to do this, I had to take some risk myself. And the first meeting of Endeavor with my co-founder Peter and myself took place at my parents' kitchen table in Newton. And when my parents overheard us plotting this global organization, they were not pleased. My father came over and reminded me that I don't have a trust fund and would need to be financially independent. If you don't want law, how about consulting, he said. When this wasn't working, my mother, who's always been very on message about her desire to have us produce grandchildren, <laughs> came over and suggested that maybe getting on planes you know, for all this time wouldn't be the best way to start a family. And besides, she said very nicely, my eggs were not getting any younger. Now, this month, I actually told my mom that she was just ahead of her time because, as most of you know, Amazon and I mean, Apple and Facebook uh, started, for better or for worse, these egg freezing programs. But so my mother was just ahead of the time. But to me, this, my kitchen table moment, as I call it, was really this moment that I think that every dreamer I know faces. It's this tension between doing what's safe and expected and doing what's unsafe and unknown. It's this juncture between fear and hope. And I chose hope. 
and I committed myself in that moment to help dreamers who are feeling scared, who are feeling stuck in their moments, get unscared and unstuck. So that really was the origin of Endeavor. Now, pretty soon after that, Peter and I had to find funding. And no one thought this was a good idea. First of all, we were starting in emerging markets. We were finding entrepreneurs. But we were starting as a nonprofit because we for, to support these very high growth business innovators because we felt there was money, there was talent, there was no trust in these markets. So we wanted to start out initially just as a pure nonprofit. And people thought this would never work. So I finally got a meeting with an Argentine real estate investor who had become one of the largest landowners and self-made entrepreneurs in the country. And it was a 10 minute meeting. His name was Eduardo, is Eduardo Elstein. And five minutes into our meeting, he looks at his watch and says, I know, you probably want a meeting with George Soros, who was his largest investor. And I looked at him and I said, no, Eduardo, I'm an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. This organization is about supporting entrepreneurs. I want your time, your passion, and $200,000. So the meeting had been taking place in English, but at this point, he turns to his right-hand guy and he says, esta chica esta loca. So I respond in Spanish that I'm disappointed that this from the man who walked into Soros' office and came out with a $10 million check, he was lucky I only asked him for 200000 At that point, he turns away. I had no idea what he was going to do. And he immediately takes out a check and writes me the $200,000. And I always say that I walked out of that meeting with our first chairman of Endeavor Argentina, $200,000, and my nickname, La Chica Loca, which when we later moved to the Middle East, carried over. So um, just to tell you a little bit, you heard the numbers. Endeavor now operates in 22 countries. We've screened 40,000 candidates, selected 1,000 to work with. And as you heard, they generate now over $7 billion annually, and they've created 400,000 jobs. So I just want to stick with Argentina for the moment and tell two stories just to encapsulate what it is that we, that we do. One of the first, so first of all, we build in every country we operate in or every city now that we've expanded also to Miami and are going to Detroit. So we're in the United States as well as Europe, as well as Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America. And in every country, we form a board of top business leaders who will agree to put their money, their time, and their networks to work to help find these innovators in every single industry, in every walk of life in their country. And the requirement is people who have an idea that really can go big. We are about that scale up moment. Uh, at that point, we scour the country. We build local teams. Endeavor now has 350 people operating uh, full time around the world. And we, we look for who these dreamers might be. We put them through a year long process. And one of the first people we met was this kid named Wences Casares. And I kept getting introduced to him by people who said, well, you're crazy. We think he's crazy. You two should meet. He had grown up on a sheep farm in Patagonia and had the idea to create the E-Trade of Latin America. Now, he did not have the right family connections or last name, but he was determined to make this happen, so much so that he convinced his two sisters to drop out of college with him and had to travel back to the sheep farm in Patagonia to tell his dad that all three kids were dropouts. Uh, that beat my story. 34 investors had turned him down. He had, he had almost nowhere to go. But we saw this kernel of this amazing entrepreneur in him. So we put him through the ringer. We selected him as an Endeavor entrepreneur. And at that point, we brought him on a road show. We helped him raise $4 million initially in venture capital, including from Fred Wilson, the, one of the top VCs in New York. We helped him find a COO and build a senior management team. Uh, we recruited a Harvard MBA to help him with a business plan. And then later, Wences married my assistant, Belle. Endeavor is a full service organization. <laughs> 18 months later, Wences sold his company, Patagon.com, to Banco Santander for $750 million. I got 34 phone calls the next day from those investors who had turned him down, saying, do you find any other entrepreneurs in our country? But here's what's really important about the story. It doesn't end there. Wences has gone to found five other companies. He's now known for a Bitcoin a company called Zappo. And he is one of the most prolific mentors and angel investors in, on the continent, even though he's now living in Silicon Valley. And four of the people he mentored 
were these four uh, guys in Buenos Aires who, when the peso devalued 66% in 2003, said, this is the best time to start a software company. And everyone said, are you kidding me? This is a disaster. Why would anyone start a software company from Argentina now? No one is going to buy this. And they said, no, you have all this design talent, and we actually have a cheaper labor force now, but we can create really high quality products. They founded a company called Globant. They came through our process. We actually rejected them the first time they came through our selection process, thinking they were too arrogant. They came back through the process, become Endeavor entrepreneurs, go on to get as their clients Disney and Google and Nike, they become one of the largest job creators in the country. And this August, uh, when all of you know Argentina was facing a, a, another debt crisis, they took Globant public on the New York Stock Exchange. And now they're creating universities within universities to help train people to get, uh, to get IT jobs. And the last story I'll tell, just because it takes the cycle forward and shows that we're about all types of entrepreneurs. And one of the things I feel is really important to tell stories of different types of people. One of the four founders of Globant sat on one of these selection panels where he'd been rejected 10 years earlier. And he was paired with Steve Case of AOL. And they were debating on a number of companies. And one of the people they selected was a woman named Al Latifa Alwa'alan. And Latifa grew up in Saudi Arabia. She got an MBA at the University of Washington and became immersed in Seattle's coffee culture. And realized how frustrated she'd been throughout her life that her mother made terrible, spicy Arabic coffee. And Latifa had tried to recreate her grandmother's delicious recipe and found it incredibly complex and time consuming. It took 30 minutes to make the coffee. And Latifa thought, oh my god, no wonder so many Saudi women are stuck for hours in the kitchen. There must be a better way. So she resolved to create an automated version of Arabic coffee, the Nespresso of Arabic coffee. She goes back to Riyadh. First, she blends seven spices and lightly roasted beans into prepackaged, pre-measured packages. She then works with local engineers, and they manufacture a machine that reduces the time to make of brewing the coffee by 75%. So her grandmother's recipe goes from 30 minutes down to seven. And like every other naysayer, people think this will never work. No one will ever buy it. Now, most of the naysayers were men. And when they went back to tell their wives, the wives were like, well, wait a minute. Where can we get one of these? And one wife said to her husband, you don't get it because you don't spend time in the kitchen. I'll take those 23 extra minutes, thank you. And Latifa just became an Endeavor entrepreneur. Uh, she now sells her uh, manufactured uh, Nespresso machine through Whole Foods and Williams-Sonoma. This year, she'll generate $10 million. And what I love about that story, and now we'll get to why I wrote the book, is that I think we need to freshen up our image of the entrepreneur. And one of the things I've realized working in so many different environments is that people hold themselves back in part because they feel like they don't have an engineering degree and don't live in Silicon Valley. So I kept saying, you don't need to be a boy in a hoodie to be an entrepreneur. And one of the things I do in the book is share many stories of Endeavor entrepreneurs and non-Endeavor entrepreneurs, people modern, people historical, people in every industry. Because I feel like if we create relatable and diverse role models, people will say, if he can do it, if she can do it, I can too. But I had two other reasons for finally sitting down and, and writing a book. Um, I should say I'm married to an author, uh, Bruce Feiler, who's written 12 New York Times bestsellers. And I will say, if any of you are married and you want empathy for your spouse, try doing what they do for a living for a couple of years. Changes your view on them. Uh, most entrepreneurship books focus on the startup. And what I've come to believe is that entrepreneurship is a journey that starts there, but it goes to the scale-up phase. It's a journey of getting going, going big, and going home. Because I think that also it's about how we marry our passions and our work lives with our family lives. And so I really wanted to write a book that carried through the entire arc of that journey. So the sections of the book are get going, go big, and go home. But my last reason for writing a book is I started getting these unexpected calls a couple years ago, first from managers of Fortune 500 companies saying, we are telling our work workers to be more entrepreneurial, and we think we're being very clear, but they're not getting the message. And then people inside those companies were telling me, 
I'm terrified. If I fail, I'm going to lose my budget or my job. Can you help me get these skills to be more entrepreneurial and get ahead at work without risking my, my, my job? And then parents at drop off at the school where Jennifer and I send our children started coming and saying, you know what, I've lost my job and I'm in transition and I don't know whether to go into another company or I have this idea that I've been looking at in my basement and I'm trying to figure out if I can take it. And what I realized is that we all need these entrepreneurial skills today. Uh, entrepreneurship is not just for the entrepreneurs that are the high growth companies as we know them. Entrepreneurship is for everyone. Michael Dell told me something that I, I love and have repeated, which is that today there are the quick and there are the dead. And to me, entrepreneurship is for people who want to get ahead and take some risk. But in fact, the riskier strategy is to do nothing at all. So that was what I set out to do. And the first thing I realized is that we need a new lexicon because we've taken this very clunky word of entrepreneur and made it even clunkier by adding all these qualifiers from social entrepreneur to mompreneur to copreneur. And so I created the zoology of entrepreneurs and told stories around them. The first are the gazelles. These are the high growth entrepreneurs from Google to Home Depot to Jenny Craig. We Endeavor works with the gazelles. Um, and that's a pretty known term. I created a term called the butterflies for people who are formerly mom and pops, but I found today they need just as many entrepreneurial skills. Even if you're starting something in your kitchen or in your basement, you actually need to know how to get on the web and how to get distributors or how to get on Shark Tank. And then there's the dolphins that are the social entrepreneurs are people also in government. And I, I use dolphins because they're the most cooperative and social animals, but if you harm a dolphin's pod or their environment, watch out. But my favorite uh, animal species in the zoo are the skunks, and many of you are skunks. This comes from Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works program that built fighter jets in the 1950s but it's also because we need people to stink up the joint. And so I, I, one of my, my favorite things that's happened in the last eight weeks since the book has been out is people are coming saying, I'm a skunk, I'm a skunk. So that is one of my goals, to breed more skunks. So let me start with get going. And I'm gonna go through some of the sections of the book and then I really wanna open it up to a lot of questions. So it turns out that the biggest barriers to getting going are actually it's you. And that everyone is looking for permission from their spouse or their parents or their boss. And really what they need to do is give themselves permission. And it's like what Bobby Jones said about golf, that it's a game played on a five inch course, the distance between your ears. And I talked to a lot of people about how they gave themselves that permission to, to go forward. And one of the things that people had to do is stop, drown out the noise around them. So we all know the phrase, Friends don't let friends drive drunk. Well, I've come to believe that friends don't let friends test drive their ideas. And the reason is that they're either trying to protect you, they're either trying to tell you, it's like taking them to the last bridal fitting and asking them to tell you that your wedding dress is anything but perfect since there's no time to change it. Or they're, going, they're so nervous that you're gonna risk everything that they're gonna tell you how terrible this idea was. And they're not reliable narrators. And one of my favorite stories in this regard is the Banana Republic founders, who are a courtroom, courtroom sketch artist and a photographer, and they decide to found this company, and they, they want to create these khaki uniforms like Safari, but they also have the cartoon artist let, sketches out these wonderful, he calls himself the Minister of Propaganda, and sketches out these kind of wonderful, quirky letters. And they're planning to use this as the marketing tool. And they go to a friend, they take it off the printers, and the friends look at this and they say, you, you can't send this out. This is horrible. Oh my God, you're, you sold, you, you left your jobs for this? You, you're going bankrupt. And they almost don't send it out, but they do. And years later, when Banana Republic sells to Gap, um, it, it's mainly because of these quirky letters that did it. So they would never have gotten it off the drawing board. So friends don't let friends test drive their ideas. Once you give yourself permission, people have all of these reasons why they can't move forward. And many of them revolve around risk. And what I've come to realize is that our attitude about entrepreneurship and risk is all wrong. Um, we talk about these moonshots, and yet just as many entrepreneurs are innovators. They start with mini innovator, innovations. They are not risk maximizers, they're actually risk minimizers. 
So first of all, we think that companies start with millions of dollars. It turns out half the Inc. 500 companies were founded with $5,000 or less. Crowdfunding makes this even easier. Second, we think people go all in and they leave their jobs immediately and they risk everything. Sarah Blakely, when she founded Spanx, many of us are familiar with her products, she sold fax machines for two years while she was getting the product up and running. Phil Knight of Nike, who's more just do it than Phil Knight? He spent nearly a decade doing other people's taxes. He worked as an accountant while someone else sold the shoes. So people don't take big risks, they, they, they start small. And even inside companies, what I realized is people did not go to the boss, people did not create these business, big business plans, they stopped planning, they started doing, but they went stealth. So when I looked at Pfizer and AT&T and MTV and Clorox and looked at these entrepreneurs, these skunks within these companies, it all fell through a pattern that they basically realized an, a, a need that needed fixing. They go and uh, with their own budgets or 10% of their time. You guys have 20% time, but most people don't. And they started and they don't get permission from the boss until they have the proof points. So at Clorox, it was these two moms that created these eco-friendly products. And it was only after they had a product line that they went and told their boss. It became Clorox Greenworks, which was the first innovation at in, in Clorox within 20 years in a major way. So stop planning and start doing. Now, the second step of entrepreneurship uh, is, is going big. But what happens at that point is that many people have engines crash to the floor, just as Henry Ford literally had his prototype of the Model T crash to smithereens before he vowed to rebuild it. And I actually have a whiteboard of all the common mistakes that entrepreneurs make and how they can then scale up. But I want to focus on two things today, and then I'm happy to answer questions. Chaos and leadership. Because one thing that is common for all entrepreneurs is you hit this moment of chaos, whether it's of your own making or whether it's the situation around you. And what I've come to realize working in Egypt after the revolution, in Miami after recession, in Greece after its financial crisis, is that stability favors the status quo, but chaos favors the entrepreneur. Walt Disney actually uh, started with nothing in his pocket. His All his cartoons were taken from him, including Oswald the Rabbit, which at that point was his successful character. It was stolen from him. And in a rage on a train, he drew a mouse with red velvet pants and buttons that became Mickey Mouse. And it was in his moment of despair, in the moment of chaos, that that creation was made. And it's so emblematic. And my favorite story in the book is actually a story of managing chaos and managing risk. And it takes place in the 1800s in northeastern France when a woman named Barbe Nicole Ponsardin inherits a family winery and is put in, put in charge of this business she knows nothing about. And she manages to revolutionize it to revolutionize it. She takes the bottles and turns them upside down, freezes off the excess yeast, and creates modern champagne as we know it. So her 1811 vintage is known as the first modern champagne. But just as Barb Nicole perfects the process, the Russians invade. And all the experienced wine owners shutter their doors to protect their vineyards. Barb Nicole spots a marketing opportunity and resolves to get the Russian army wasted. Today they drink, tomorrow they will pay, she says. And this works incredibly well, and she makes one more calculated risk, which is before peace is signed, she runs the blockades, gets her bottles right outside St. Petersburg and Moscow so that when tr the treaty is signed, her bottles arrive first, beating out the competition. Tsar Alexander declares he will drink only the widow. Veuve is the French word for, wid for widow, and Barb Nicole's late husband was Francois Clicquot. This is the story of Veuve Clicquot, and it's the story of how one woman embraced the turbulence around her and took smart risks to become the first female owner of a multinational. It's a great story. So the last thing I want to just briefly mention before we go to questions is I did a lot of digging into leadership and this is really important in the context of skunks because as I mentioned before all of these leaders were saying I don't understand we talk about failure we talk about risk taking why isn't getting it through and it turns out 40 percent of managers today say they won't take risks because they fear retribution if something goes wrong 
and I looked at, okay, everyone talks about and gives lip service to failure. What are companies that actually really do a good job at, at inculcating this into the, the philosophy? And two that came up, one is to the Tata group. So Ratan Tata runs the largest conglomerate in India. He actually just retired. And in his last year as chairman, and he's in his 70s, he announces a prize for the best failed idea which I think every company in the world should institute, a prize for the best failed idea. The other story, which was really uh, uh, new to me, was the story of WD-40. We all use this product to get our squeaky doors. Does anyone know how it started? Okay, so it was in the 1950s, this guy named Norm Larson was trying to solve rust in the aerospace industry. And he tries one formula. He figures it has to do with water displacement. First formula doesn't work. Second formula doesn't work. 39 formulas fail. The 40th formula, he gets it right. He brings it to General Dynamics, and it works in the missiles, but the workers start sneaking at home to fix those car doors. And so Nor Norm Larson's like, wait a minute. I got something here. I'm going to create a consumer-facing company. Looks to name the product, goes back to his lab notes, water displacement, 40th formula. So failure is inherent in the brand. And today the CEO says, for every decision in the company, we are going to have these learning moments. We're going to talk about what failed and what went wrong in addition to what went right. So I think there are things that you can actually do to actually go from talking about failure to embedding this notion of risk taking. I also, again, while I love the moonshots idea, I think for some people that scares people off. And I've come to believe that minivations, these mini innovations, are almost as important as the moonshot ideas, and then we need to have both. But the last thing I'll, I'll talk about, because it's the most personal, it was the hardest for me to learn, was as a female leader, I had always thought that the job was to be independent and strong and, you know, confident, and to separate your family life from your business life. And this worked well for a while. Then I had identical twins, and I was put on bed rest. And so that kind of went out the window. But I was still kind of managing somewhat. And then six years ago, my husband, Bruce, got diagnosed with a rare case of bone cancer. And we learned that he was going to have to go through a year of chemotherapy. He would also have a 16-hour surgery to replace his entire femur and to graft the fibula onto the femur. This had been performed only twice before. Our girls were three at the time. And this was right when Endeavor had gotten $10 million to double the rate of our expansion. And I was not getting on a plane. I was going to go to those chemotherapy sessions and make sure the girls were stable. And I told the board and I told the team. And what never surprised me was that Endeavor surpassed its growth targets and that everyone stepped up. But here's what did surprise me. When I came back full time, Bruce, I should say, is six years cancer free. And when I came back to work, two employees pulled me aside and they said, you know, Linda, we always admired you, and we thought you were superhuman. And not in a good way. This was in an unrelatable way. And they said, now that we know who you are as a person, now that we've seen you be vulnerable, now we'll follow you anywhere. So the lesson for leaders is less super, more human. I'm going to end there that the last section of the book is go home. I talk a lot about not only work-life integration, but about creating atmospheres where people can do well and do good. Um, millennials in particular have really led the way, I think, in showing why impact matters. But I really would love to open it up to all of you. So thank you and ready to answer any questions. that we have books for sale. The hardcover books are on sale for $10 in the back room. So please, please have at it. And I would like to point out that I worked every day with Teo Suarez on this book. He is now a Googler, but I just want to personally thank him for all his great work on Crazy as a Compliment. Hi, my name is Lindsay. Hello. Hi, my dad's an entrepreneur. He's an yes. inventor. 
for lack of a better term, he's a chemical engineer, so he has patents in his name, and I've always admired him quite a bit for how he's able to build something from nothing over the last 30 years. I have very different skill sets, and I think more about kind of taking ideas that are already existing and making them a little bit more fun, interesting, more age appropriate. So I'd love to hear about what you know types of businesses you've worked with where it's more about tweaking an existing idea and making it better, as opposed to what my dad does literally thinking of things no one has thought of before. That is a great question. And I think that many of us grew up thinking if we weren't the inventor type, then we weren't entrepreneurs. We might be managers in entrepreneurial companies, but we couldn't be entrepreneurs ourselves. I've come to completely change my view on this. And in fact, at one point, we've gotten to a thousand entrepreneurs at Endeavor, and they were so diverse, not only in the industries they were working in and their backgrounds, but in their approaches as leaders and their strengths and weaknesses. And yet they were all trying to model themselves after Steve Jobs. And I was like, but this isn't working. You have different strengths and different weaknesses. So I worked with Bain and Company for three years on an entrepreneur personality test. It's really a personality test as a leader. You can go download it at lindarotenberg.com, a shortened version. And what we realized, we came up with four personality types. These are different from my species, but um, one of them, so the, the rocket ships are people who really care about efficiency and metrics and taking things that work and making them even better. The stars focus on brands and they're more sort of personality driven, often and more in the arts. Transformers often take older businesses and kind of modernize them. And they're really interested in, in both kind of the mission of the new businesses, but how you kind of transform these old school products and services. And then the diamonds are more of the classic kind of inventor types. And each of these personalities, as I said, has the ability to be the leader and the entrepreneur, but who you surround yourself as a team, as advisors, and as mentors, does change. So I would encourage you to take this uh, personality test. We have a longer version if you're, if you're really interested. Hi. Um, I guess my question is, is I think a lot of people sit and they think of an idea and then they think, oh, someone probably has done this. Someone probably knows better about this. Who am I to do this? Um, and I guess what kind of advice do you have for, you know, one, getting a sense if you should be doing that to yep. kind of how to just go through that process? The greatest ideas I've come to believe do not die in the marketplace or in the laboratory or in the conference room. They die in the minds of the people who have them and never get them off the ground for exactly that reason. I think today, more than ever before, with crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, we have ways to get early feedback that's not from those family and friends uh, earlier than ever before. And so I really encourage people to test that out because I think that the great thing about crowdfunding and crowdsourcing is it's not just about the money. It's whether people actually are motivated to, uh, to say, I need that product, I need that service. So, I, and I think that with social media, even using uh, you know other social networks, there's ways to get that instant feedback. But what I would say is it goes back to that permission and that, that the biggest barriers to getting going, it's not money, it's not the structural impediments, it's people holding themselves back. And you'll find out soon enough, it's all about execution at the end, and I know what I always say is the marketplace tells you for, uh, soon enough, just don't hold yourself back initially. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Linda. Thanks for coming. So you talk about, um, I mean, you've met a lot of entrepreneurs through Endeavor. And I guess the question I have is regarding survivorship bias in terms of you see a lot of entrepreneurs who have essentially been very successful, or at least successful to some degree. Um, do you ever think about, like, in terms of encouraging us all to be entrepreneurial, is there ever, there's always that factor that, I feel like sometimes we, we ignore, and that's the doubt in our minds, right, is the whole, that's what kind of holds us back sometimes. And do you address that in the book? And like kind of your thoughts about that in general. In, in terms of only talking about the success stories? Exactly. Is yeah, that the, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's why I spend so much time talking about people hitting walls, talking about whether it's the chaos, which often is external, but sometimes is, instern or is internal with our own screw-ups, to this whiteboard of common mistakes people have at that scale-up moment when they actually go flat or actually start, start crashing. One of the things that we talk about a lot um, are you know the mechanics of the deal or the distribution or the demand. 
I've seen, oftentimes it's actually relationships between and among founders that kill things. I always say Endeavor 101 is how to fire your mother-in-law and still show up for family dinner. <laughs> um, and talking about getting startup prenups when you start with friends and family, things like to that other question where people don't know themselves and they don't but properly assess their own strengths and weaknesses in, as an entrepreneur, and they don't surround themselves with the right people. So I go very much into detail of, of not only people from unexpected backgrounds to make them more diverse and relatable and accessible, but also all of the stumbling blocks, that entrepreneurship is not just this linear path to success. It, 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 we often are told that, and it seems like the instant rags to riches. I think more of us need to talk about the problems and the struggles, and not only the external struggles, but the internal internal emotional ones as well. And back to the question about crowdfunding, um, IBM and some other companies are starting internal crowdfunding platforms for skunks. <laughs> so people are actually getting feedback, on, so they all get $100, and they can actually put the, their money based on which of their peers' ideas they actually think will likely work best. I love that idea, too. Just getting a sense of, will people put their money where their mouth is to know which ideas tend to have takeoff potential. Yes. Thanks so much for your comments, Linda. Um, I can't wait to read the book. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about the group of guys in Argentina, I think that you said made it through the first round, and you kind of turned them down because of ar perceived arrogance. But then the second time around, something clicked there. Um, in the context of your story about how you approached that other investor um, and said, you're lucky I didn't ask you for you know $10 million. I'm asking you for 200000 which could be perceived as arrogant, but it's really confidence and believing in yourself mm -hmm. and um, those things. But, you know, there's a, I think with, with all people, maybe women, especially in business and in, in um, the entrepreneurial world, yes. there's a fine line to walk there. Um, uh, great question. And I will answer it in two ways. With the Globant boys, they, yeah, they just, they just seemed to have had everything figured out and we thought would they even take advice? I think that was the question we had. And I'm so proud of them. And they say that as a defining moment, there were four founders. They all four met, they wept. <laughs> and then when they found out they were rejected the first time and they met and they decided we're gonna go through this process again. And I will tell you in part because of that story and the success they've had, but how impactful it was to actually face rejection and have to come back and change their own approach. We now 20 percent of the entrepreneurs Endeavor Selects are rejected the first time and come back, which is pretty amazing. With regard to women, so one of the things I hear a lot is, well, people have these connections when you go in Silicon Valley. There's a sense, you know, only 8% of female-led companies are venture-backed in the sense we're not part of the club and what can we do? And, and what I always say is that there's the dark arts of entrepreneurship that they don't teach in business school. And many people of all genders use, but I found particular I used and um, some of my favorite female entrepreneurs use, and I'll tell one story, and it is of stalking. I always say stalking is an underrated startup strategy. And I used to trap people in confined spaces, but my favorite story um, is a woman named Josephine Esther Menser. And she grows up in a Hungarian Jewish family in uh, Queens. And she uh, com grows up very poor, but aspires to light luxury. So she sees a woman at a beauty salon with this nice blouse and says, where did you get that blouse? And the woman looks at her and says, what does it matter? You could never afford it. And Estelle, as she is known, Josephine, she gets so mad and she says, I'm going to have it all. I'm going to have the luxury. I'm going to have the art. And she realizes that her uncle John is this struggling chemist who can't sell these products. So she goes and literally stalks people outside of Salvation Army meetings and in the elevators and says that her all-purpose cream can solve their wrinkles. They don't think they have wrinkles, but nonetheless, she does this. And she builds up a nice little business, but she does not want to sell in drugstores. She covets luxury. She wants to sell at Saturday. Fifth Avenue. So she starts stalking the buyer, but he's like, I'm sorry, there's this unknown brand and you're this unknown entrepreneur. No way. And she says, all right, I've got to do two things. I've got to get more strategic. So first she changes her name. So it's Josephine Esther Menser. She changes it to Este and takes her married name, Lauder. And the next thing she does is at the, at the Waldorf Astoria, there's this charity luncheon, and she gives away these lipsticks and these metallic sheaths, which are this big step up from plastic. And the women get one free one and ask her where they can buy another. And she says, oh, why don't you try Saks down the street? 
And as the buyer then says, there was a, a line that forms from the Waldorf Astoria all the way to Saks Fifth Avenue, and the next day he places an order. So yes, stalking is an underrated startup strategy. Linda, um, thank you for your talk, and thank you for that story. Actually, my team calls on Estee Lauder, and we um, we actually want to try and remind the Estee Lauder business to be a little bit more like the founder today because it's gotten so big. So we're like, how can you yeah. be a little bit more nimble in today's world? And you have to go back to the founding. The, the DNA in fact, of, right. in fact, GE when it came out of the financial crisis, they went back to Thomas Edison and said, "We're builders, not bankers," because GE Capital had become such the face of the co company. They had to go back to their founding days. So, so it's like staying good true on you exactly who you are throughout the process. Um, question about your management style. So the example you just gave about your husband when he was sick, and thank goodness that is everything's great there. Um, that was clearly a moment where you had to say, okay, what's super important to me and probably turn over the reins of the business to other people you trust. Um, what are other moments kind of in your experience maybe after that in the last six years that you've had to also say, not just for significant moments, but just in the day-to-day -to, -day to kind of help other leaders within your organization kind of stand up and find their own voice and their own ground. Yeah, I, I, it's partly about giving people a space to grow and partly knowing your own strengths and weaknesses and realizing that not everyone is motivated like you are. So I'm someone who, I don't care about titles, I don't care about vacation days. I'm like, you get your work done, doesn't matter. And I realized after a while, it actually mattered to people. There are people who wanted rules. I was like, you want rules? Rules are meant to be broken, but no, they wanted rules. And our president, Fernando Fabre, I actually had, I, I was very unsuccessful in getting a COO because I recruited from Nike and Disney and I thought people wanted more corporate people. And it turns out they wanted someone who had the DNA of Endeavor. And I ended up hiring three years ago, three and a half years ago, the person who's now um, our president, Fernando Fabre, who had uh, been seven years our managing director in Mexico. And I noted that anytime anyone in the world had a problem with me, they went to him. I was like, all right, let's just make this official and why don't you come be a COO? He's like, I'm not doing that failed title with you, with these two failed. CEO, COOs, you make me president and I'll move. So El Presidente uh, now sets the sets the agenda. And it's been so nice and we respect each other so well, but having those complementary skills, there are some people who really need the the you know the structure uh, that he wants. There's some people want, and I'm freed up to kind of give the love, right? And the and the inspiration. And I think that it goes back to knowing yourself and realizing um, you know, to get going. It's all about you and your idea, but to go big, it's about co-creation. And to go big, if it remains all about you, you're not getting very far. So that actually set, set me up perfectly for the question that I was going to ask, which is you do a brilliant job sort of demystifying that there is a single archetype, archetype of an entrepreneur. Um, and really breaking it down into the different flavors of that. And I think Probably um, one of the things that I experience and I and I see talked about and I and in talking to people is it's a very um, it's a very sort of solo uh, you know archetype the the original entrepreneur is yeah. that I'm doing it myself it's my idea I'm creating it on my own um, but you mentioned the, the concept of you know sort of surrounding yourself with the right people that will complement your skills which I think is really important you know and especially at Google we're so fortunate to work amongst brilliant talented individuals so I'm curious to get your your take on your own companies the Endeavor companies have you been have you experienced you know people coming in and sort of for lack of a better word kind of hoarding the idea and you kind of sending them back and saying, listen, great idea, but go surround yourself with people who can make it happen or, you know, to, to refine it. Yeah. Uh, entrepreneurship is not a solo sport. And I think not only are there studies that many of the most successful companies are run by pairs or trios of founders, not just one. Um, I should say also the two fastest growing groups starting businesses today are baby boomers over 55. And actually women are now starting to st launch companies at faster rates than ever before. So back to you don't need to be a boy in a hoodie to be an entrepreneur. Uh, Here's the thing I, I will end on because it, 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 it's so emblematic of, of what I've learned at Endeavor, which is not only in companies do you need to surround yourself with this 
group of people that are the co-creators. Not only do you need a, not just one mentor, but a circle of, of mentors, but the process of entrepreneurship itself, Endeavor is now looking at what makes cities conducive to entrepreneurship. And it is not top-down uh, regulatory changes. It is not creating incubators. It is not creating VC firms. It is successful entrepreneurs mentoring, investing in, and inspiring the next generation. So what we've done in, in Argentina, in Istanbul, in Amman, Jordan, now we just released yesterday a tech map of New York, are what happens when successful entrepreneurs pay it forward. And in fact, you see this incredible effect of, of them going and and angel investing and mentoring, and that's how entrepreneurship breeds. So one of the things we're doing is saying this is happening very well in many places, but mainly in tech, and mainly with the guys. So back to the women question, back to the non-tech question. We're saying if you're in retail, if you're in food and beverage, if you're, uh, you know, if we're a woman, if you're an older person, do this, give back, spend part of your time mentoring and angel investing, because that's actually the way that an ecosystem, that a community of entrepreneurs is created. Thank you. Thank you all.